turn in your Bibles to the fifth chapter of the book of Galatians. Galatians 5. We are taking, if you're new, three weeks, which began last week, to walk through our threefold description of our new launch name, Trinity Community Church. We describe ourselves this way. We are grace-based, we are spirit-empowered, and we are outwardly focused. And last week, for a brief time, we took that phrase, grace-based, and I tried to unpack it. And we realized it means more than just some amorphous experience of grace in a moment but that we are called as a church to believe and teach gospel doctrine. The most important being the article which Luther said, the church of God rises and falls, justification by faith alone. And we talked about that this morning. I want to move on to the second description, spirit empowered, how we walk. And one verse in Galatians 5, very short verse, verse 25. I'm going to read it from the NIV this morning. It's a little closer to the original. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Let's pray. Father. We uh, are overwhelmed this morning at your goodness. Your presence is real. And by your great will, you redeemed us and bought us back with precious blood of a lamb. And then you filled us with the Holy Spirit of God. What can we say? Your grace has done all of this. We deserve none of it. And this morning, Lord, we who live by the Spirit, we pray that we would learn how to keep in step with the Spirit. Show us that you didn't give us our, your Spirit just to have a neat experience, but to be guided by the Spirit, empowered by the Spirit, impelled by the Spirit, led by the Spirit in all that we act and all that we think. Help us to understand these things this morning by the power of your Spirit. And I acutely feel my weakness this morning to convey these great, wonderful truths. Help me and help your people to receive it. In Jesus' name we ask. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. In his faithful narrative of surprising conversions, Jonathan Edwards described some of the unusual supernatural happenings that were occurring in the town of Northampton, Massachusetts, where he pastored in the year 1734. This was a town where Ed Edwards says that they had a previously experienced, quote, a degenerate time with dullness of religion. I read that and thought how it applies today. A degenerate time with dullness of religion. Young people, he said, were rebelling and living in open flagrant sin. Community leaders were locked into bitter disputes. Religion seemed to be, an interest in religion seemed to be at an all-time low. But in tandem with this, the church in Northampton that Edwards pastored began praying for God to move and specifically calling out to God to, for the souls of their neighbors. In that year, Edwards himself began to preach a series, powerfully preach a series on the subject of justification by faith alone. The result first was six young people were powerfully converted. One was a young woman who was notorious for her sin in the town, 
who was so radically changed by the gospel that it soon became the talk of the town of New Northampton. And in the next six months, 300 of the town's 1,000 residents were converted. That's 25% of the town was sovereignly converted in that year. Edwards goes on in his narrative to describe some of the supernatural happenings that were occurring in this work. And he said, quote, God has also seemed to go out of his usual way in the quickness of his work and the swift progress his Holy Spirit has made in the operation on the hearts of many. There was scarcely a single person in the town, either young or old, that was left unconcerned about the great things of the eternal world. The town seemed to be full of the presence of God. It never was so full of love and joy. It was a time for joy, joy in families. Our public assemblies were beautiful. The congregation was alive in God's service. Everyone earnestly intent on public worship. God was served in the beauty of holiness. What Edwards is describing for those of you who are not familiar with this history, is what is now described as the beginning of the first great awakening. And it is a classic description of biblical revival. Those times when God seems to rend the heavens and literally come down on people in sovereign glory and power. This was the beginning of the revival in 1734, with a second wave coming in the 1740s. It had everything, by the way, to do with preparing the young nation of America to be born in 1776. But what is surprising about this revival, if you know anything about its history, is it seemed to come at various times and then suddenly stop without any warning. And it would be easy to conclude, and scholars and those who comment on history have attempted to, that when it stopped, it must have been stopped because of some human reasoning. Maybe the church ceased to pray, or the church wasn't properly preaching gospel doctrine, or maybe there was sin in the camp, but if you came to those conclusions, you would be wrong. It didn't stop because of something the church did or didn't do, for when it stopped, the churches were continuing to do what they had previously done, preach the gospel, live in holiness, and uh, walk with God. The truth is, Edwards himself tells us what he believed about this spiritual awakening and what he believed about all awakenings. And by inference, he tells us why it stopped. In an article entitled, Jonathan Edwards, His Theology of Revival and Awakening, the author, Brett Hicks, says, quote, the same pattern also held true in Edwards' view of corporate revival and awakening. These, listen, I want you to listen to this. These were not the product of human invention and design, but were rather the sovereign work of God. For him, revival occurred not when proper means were employed, but when the Spirit of God began extraordinarily to set in and wonderfully work among us. Now, that does not mean the church has no responsibility, but Edwards understood that the phenomena called revival, which is biblical and historical, is sent by God by His own sovereign preference. There are times in our history, not ours, Trinity, but in the history of the church of God, when God has seen fit to send these powerful moves of the Spirit upon the church. Yet it is also clear that while Scripture allows for these extraordinary periods, Listen to what I'm about to say. The focus of Scripture is not on these extraordinary times, 
but rather on God's provision for his people at all times. Maybe the best way to front end this is to play devil's advocate, because I believe, I believe that we can pray for revival. I believe it's biblical to do so, and I believe it's incumbent upon us. But let me play the devil's advocate. What if we pray for revival and it doesn't happen? Are we helpless until God sends some extraordinary outpouring of the Spirit upon us? I know a lot of people who are living for the next revival. I hope they're right and it comes, but what if it doesn't come? Are they helpless? And, and, and until God sends extraordinary periods, there is no provision. Let me answer my own question. I'm playing the devil's advocate. You know what I'm saying. But let me tell you one simple declaration that says we don't have to wait for the next revival. Here it is. The Holy Spirit has already come. The Holy Spirit has come. And because He has come, we would receive extraordinary outpourings of His Spirit when He brings them in His sovereign preference. But because He has come, we are not bound to wait for some extraordinary period of revival before we can serve God, walk in His ways, and be empowered to do His work. Someone once said to me, you know, Neil, we need another Pentecost. The truth is, we don't need another Pentecost. We need to understand what it means that the Holy Spirit has already come, and because He's come, we're in Christ, and more importantly, that the Holy Spirit, because we are in Christ, has taken up His residence in us. So let me give you the working premise of this message based on the text we read in Galatians 5.25. Here's the premise. Listen carefully. Even though God does send extraordinary periods of revival in His church, the most powerful thing is when individual Christians and churches live up to their full potential of life in the Spirit. Can I read that again? And then explode. Even though God does send extraordinary times of revival, the most powerful thing is when individual Christians live up to their full potential of life in the Spirit. Apparently, Paul believes that. Notice in our text this morning what he is saying to the Galatian church. Here are believers who have already been regenerated by the Spirit, who, by the way, was working mightily in their midst. Miracles were happening. In Galatians 3, he alludes to the fact that the Spirit was in their midst doing miracles, bearing witness to Jesus. But they were being seduced doctrinally by a false gospel that the Judaizers were putting them under, bringing them back under the law. We went through that when we studied the Galatian epistles many moons ago. And Paul labors for four chapters to refute the false teaching by teaching the gospel of the grace of God, calling them back to good gospel doctrine. By the way, notice this. Everybody listen to me intently. Paul did not come in their midst and say, you need a revival. That's the only hope for your church. He says, no, you're in the condition you're in because you've departed from the gospel. You have to return to gospel doctrine. But in chapter 5, he reminds them that the normal Christian life is animated, directed, empowered by the Spirit. Listen to the way he broke this down. He said in our verse this morning, he first reminds them that their life is in the Spirit. He says, if we live by the Spirit. And it's a no-brainer for Paul because he had taught these Christians that now that they've been regenerated by the work of the Spirit, they live by the Spirit. And the reason he can say that 
is it is the Spirit who first brought them to life from the dead. This is the first work of the Spirit. The first work of the Spirit in every and any life is called regeneration. It is God raising dead people up to life. The greatest description of that, perhaps in the entire Bible, is really in the Old Testament in chapter 36 of Ezekiel. And I want you to notice the eyes. There are seven eyes in this passage, all saying what God will do. I'm not going to read the whole passage. But it's the perfect description of how God raises sinners from the dead who cannot respond to God until they come alive, and the Spirit regenerates them. Listen to his promise in Ezekiel 36, 26. I will give you a what? Say it. New heart and a new spirit I will put within you. That's small s. This is called heart work. The first thing of the doctrine of regeneration is apparently God sees your heart and mine as beyond repair. He doesn't give us religion. He doesn't cover it up. He says, I'll give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Before you came to Christ, you couldn't respond to the gospel. Your heart was stone. You could no more respond to the gospel than I could take you to a cemetery this afternoon and command you to talk to dead people to come alive. They're dead, they're under stone. That's you and I. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh. And here's the second part of it. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. Ezekiel is describing what New Testament theologians call the doctrine of regeneration, where God first transforms human hearts and makes them flesh, tender, responsive. Somebody said to me, well, I, I believe I responded to God. You did. But there's a reason you did. God took your stony heart out and gave you a tender heart. Someone said to me once, I don't believe God draws people to heaven kicking and screaming. I said, I don't either, because he so changed my heart, I now want to go. But even though the Holy Spirit is now the source of our life, if we live by the Spirit, he must also be the source of the power we need to live a life pleasing to God. George Eldon Ladd, a scholar and theologian, observed, quote, the power of the indwelling spirit is not spontaneous, all-possessing power. It requires a human response. If we live by the spirit, that's God's work, Here's yours. Keep in step with the Spirit. Most of your translations probably say, if we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. But what is interesting, the word for walk in verse 25, our text this morning, is not the word used in verse 16, where Paul tells the Galatians, I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of of the flesh. But the Greek word in verse 25, walk, is really, if we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. And that's a great way to phrase it. The Greek word, keep in step, is an interesting word. You could use it for military formation, or you could use it for dancing. And since we're in the church, I'll dispense with the dash dancing illusion, because it's dancing, it's one of our core beliefs at Trinity, dancing is demonic, <laughs> along with bowling, and Australian dwarf tossing, which is an actual sport. <laughs> 
It doesn't matter if you're talking about a military union or a husband and wife ballroom dancing. Notice I said it right, husband and wife. <laughs> because those who march in step and those who dance in step, march in step and dance in step with someone who is leading them. Look at a military formation, how they keep in step. In Paul's day, military battles were very different than they are in our day. In fact, in, in the Roman world, defense strategies were based on a very strict pattern of working together and keeping in step. You've probably seen them in Roman movies where Roman uh, uh, shields, you know, they would take their shields and, and they, were, they were made in such a way that they could be locked to one another on either, either side. So they actually formed a wall of protection. You've seen that. And soldiers in Rome would practice for hours in military units so they know how to keep in step with one another. And you can see it at, at West Point today and other military unions. Or, or perhaps even clearer is the analogy of ballroom dancing where the woman must follow the lead of the man and perfectly keep in step with him. And I know because I've been ballroom dancing for years. Never have. Never have, never will. Because, you know, I'm doing, I do Fit Club occasionally on Tuesday nights, and they do stuff, and I am the most uncoordinated guy in the world. I can dance before the Lord, but it doesn't have any rhyme or reason. That's why I do it at home. Both of these analogies, that of military unit, that of ballroom dancing, make it clear that it, the way we do this effectively is to follow the lead of another. And Paul is saying, you have your life in the Spirit, now you must keep in step with the Spirit. Paul is certain that the Spirit who enlivened us and raised us from the dead will now lead us as the governor of all the work of God. Everything the triune God purposes for your life, my life, for the church, for the work of God, all of it now is governed by the Spirit who was given to glorify Jesus. And here's the truth. The Spirit is ready to lead if you are ready to follow. The Spirit is ready to lead if you are ready to follow. Maybe the question we should ask is, where is He leading us? Do we have any clue in Scripture? And the answer, of course, is yes. Remember in John 14, Jesus has just announced it. And by the way, when you read John 14, you should, be, you should feel their devastation. Because he has just said a few, well, the chapter before, a few moments before, in a little while, for a little while I am with you, where I am going, you cannot come. Have you ever felt that? You have to know how attached they had become to Yeshua, to Jesus. And out of nowhere, they had no preview, previous knowledge of this, he says, I'm, I'm leaving. You can't follow me. But then in chapter 14, he tells them in verse 15 through 18, if you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. I will not leave you as orphans. Listen, I will come to you. That is not a rapture verse. It is not a second coming verse. He is telling them something incredible. I'm leaving, but it's to your advantage. I'm sending someone that will make me more real to you than if I remained in the flesh. 
The Spirit does not come primarily. I didn't say it isn't included, it is. But he does not come primarily to anoint men and women to do work for Jesus. That's a byproduct of something. J.I. Packer, in his book, Keep in Step with the Spirit, says it best, quote, quote, the distinctive, constant, basic ministry of the Spirit in the New Covenant is so to mediate Christ's presence to believers, that is to give them such a knowledge of his presence with them as Savior, Lord, and God, that three things are happening. Friends, this is such a juicy quote. I got to read it again. The Spirit in the New Testament or the New Covenant, his purpose is to mediate Christ's presence to believers. That is to give them such knowledge of his person with them as Savior, Lord, and God that three things result. Let's look at the three things. And you can do a check, a pulse check, because if these three, three things are going on in your life, in my life, then I'm keeping in step with the Spirit. But if they're not going on, maybe I didn't need to do a heart check. Number one, personal, the Spirit comes to bring us into personal fellowship with Jesus. What began in Galilee 2,000 years ago is happening in Knoxville, Tennessee in 2013. Here's the most amazing thing a human being can ever utter. It's the words, I know Jesus. He's alive, he's real, I know him. And you can tell if a person is keeping in step in the spirit by whether or not they are focusing on Jesus, are aware of Jesus, are having fellowship with Jesus. In a word, they're centered on Jesus. Even though Jesus is no longer visible on earth, but is enthroned in heaven, the Spirit presents him as the living Lord so that we begin to have fellowship with him. Remember what it says in Mark's gospel about why Jesus chose 12 guys? He chose 12 that they might be with him and that he might send them to preach and cast out devils. God, Paul says, is faithful, 1 Corinthians 1, 9, by whom you were called into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ. I want to ask you a question this morning. This fellowship means that the Spirit is always leading you to Jesus, to be aware of Jesus, to love Jesus. Perhaps more than that, the Spirit is always leading us to know that we are loved by Jesus and that he has redeemed us. Do you ever notice the way the apostles prayed for their converts in Ephesians 1? I pray that you may be strengthened with might by the Spirit in the inner man that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints the length, the breadth, the depth, the height, and to know the love of Christ that passes knowledge so that you may be filled to all the fullness of God. Wow. And the Spirit impels us to have fellowship with Jesus and to make time for Jesus. I mean, let's face it. If you're fellowshipping with Jesus, you'll love this book. If you're fellowshipping with Jesus, you'll love time alone with him. Again, I'm reading Luke in my personal devotional life, and I came to the story of Martha and Mary day before last. I got through it quickly. 
with minimal conviction. Most of us or many of us can relate to Martha more than we can Mary. We like being busy, and being busy is a token that we love Jesus. And it can be because Jesus has distributed to all of us tasks. But Martha, it, it, and it's, it's, it's such a golden text that screams out at me. Martha was distracted by much service. I have a question. I feel like it was posed to me. Are you so busy serving Jesus that you're really not having fellowship with Jesus? Second thing that we will be will happen with us if we keep in step with the Spirit is the Spirit comes to transform us so that we become like Jesus. You could say that personal fellowship with Jesus starts by God's action. It begins when we begin to know the love of Christ for us, but that's not where we stay. The result should be that the Spirit is now leading us to personal, total devotion to Jesus Christ in every way with no holds barred. In other words, when I know the love of Jesus for me, the Spirit now will lead me to learn to love Jesus, to know Jesus, and to want to be like Jesus. In other words, I am so convinced of His love for me that my response is I want to give myself away to Him and my personal character. I want to reflect Jesus. You have to be totally devoted to Jesus to cooperate with a process called sanctification going on in every Christian's life where God wants to transform my life to be like Jesus. You notice in the earlier part of the chapter, it says the works of the flesh are evident, and he names them. Many of them are so-called social sins. But when he comes to the fruit of the Spirit, I would expect it to be plural, the fruits of the Spirit, but it's not. It's singular, the fruit of the Spirit. Anybody know why the fruit of the Spirit is singular? Because the fruit of the Spirit is nothing more, folks, than the character of Jesus. It's a description of Jesus. It's singular because it's Him. And you can always tell if a person is keeping in step with the Spirit if they have a desire to and are becoming like Jesus and they want to be devoted to Jesus. This is an earmark that you're keeping in step with the Spirit. You begin to learn and experience what Paul tells us in the eighth chapter of Romans. Those, and that's us, whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of His Son. When God elected you and I in eternity past, it was with the purpose of what Ephesians 1 tells us. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. He didn't choose you to just hang out and sort of just have no purpose, and He chose you so that He would start in your life and mine a process whereby through my personal devotion to Jesus, I begin to look, talk, and act like Jesus. If you want to know if you're, you are walking, acting, and talking like Jesus, don't ask me or an elder. Ask your wife. Ask your husband. Ask your kids. Because I know how to fake it. How are you? Praise the Lord. How's your family? Glory to God. <laughs> you know what that's called? Artificial fruit. Looks like the real deal. Boy, he certainly has joy, yes, but he's a terrorist at home. He's Al-Qaeda at home. Here's one, this is kind of silly, but it's so obvious, it's silly, that one, one obvious way 
that you can measure whether you're becoming like Jesus is you're being delivered from your innate selfishness. There are people who claim to be Christians who from waking thought in the morning to waking thought in the evening, it's only about them. They live to get people in their orbit. It's about my needs. It's about my wants. It's about my desires. Oh, I'm benevolent and occasionally I might for a few seconds think about you, but it's all about me. People come to churches, people leave churches because it's about me. Feed me, heal me, focus on me. I am important. Part of the deliverance of God to make you fruitful is to kill you. He's trying to kill you in me. So it's about Jesus. And when you think about Jesus, love Jesus and become conformed to Jesus, it's about ministry to others. So here's an earmark that might be biblical. I'm keeping in step with the Spirit when I'm being led away from self and focused on God and others. That's not to say there isn't legitimate time to say I need some help and get ministry. It's not selfish to need prayer or, or need biblical exhortation. And the bottom line is if you have not made, and I have not made, and I say this with love from the bottom of my heart, but if I've not made Romans 8.29, that he predestined me to be conformed to the image of his son. If that's not settled in my heart, I have no idea why the things happening to me are happening. I mean, it's just, it makes no sense. And finally, a good segue for next week. The Spirit comes so that we might cooperate with the ministry of Jesus. I'll end this quickly. We're going to, this is our Lord's Supper service, which we do on the fifth Sunday of each month when five Sundays exist. And this morning we're going to take the Lord's table. There is no such thing as cooperation with the Spirit that does not lead ultimately to me pouring myself in others. And this happens in two ways in the church. Number one, there is no such thing as keeping in step with the Spirit that does not lead me to become an active part of the community of believers in which I am using the gifts and abilities that I have for the good of others. Listen to Romans 12. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. But there's another way that we cooperate with the Spirit in keeping in step, and that is in the most important work of cooperating with Jesus in his ministry of confronting a sinful world with the good news. You can always tell if a person is keeping in step with the Spirit by whether or not they are cooperating in the ministry of Jesus in confronting the world with the gospel, and every single man, woman, and child in the body of Christ is part of this. I love what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 6, 1. So then, working together with him, not for him, but with him. And last time I checked, Jesus is drawing sinners to himself through the Spirit, but they must hear the gospel, and that's where we come in. He's drawing, but he's drawing them to the church so they might hear the gospel. And we keep in step by the Spirit by becoming midwives. We don't birth people in the kingdom, pressure's off. We are midwives. We just coach the birth as God is bringing sinners to his son. And I don't know, I don't know anything about midwifery, so why am I even venturing? Never mind. Because... <laughs> because I'm going to get some women on my case later. <laughs> you know nothing about being mid a midwife, and I confess that I don't, so I should stay out of the arena. But I'm sure there's different types of med midwives or different times when they function, but I could be wrong. <laughs> it's happened before. Once. <laughs> we keep in step with the Spirit as I close this out. When we carry a burden for people, 
Jesus, John 4, I must go to Samaria. I must needs pass through Samaria. That's not true, because Jews would leave and go up around the Jordan and uh, bypass Samaria because they hated Samaritans. But Jesus in John 4 says to the 12, I must needs go to Samaria. He knows he has an appointment with one woman. Philip, I have to leave the revival in Samaria and go into the wilderness where the Spirit has swept me up. Sometimes the Spirit will tell us specifically to speak to someone with urgency the gospel. At other times, and this is what I'm praying for our church, that we keep in step by the Spirit by forming long-term relationships with unbelievers and seeking God for an opportunity to share the gospel with them. But this is about spirit empowerment. So let me tell you the ultimate empowerment. It's the Spirit who empowers us to boldly share the gospel. No one in this room can wimp out by saying, well, I'm a naturally shy individual. So am I. I really am. Besides, forget me or you, how do you account for the 12 disciples who forsook Jesus and ran away, and Peter, who denied him three times before a servant girl warming herself by a fire, and he ran away. Well, I guess, you know, Peter, you're just naturally shy. You're, you're just not made, you're not fit for this gospel work. But you know what Acts 4 says? When they saw the boldness of John and Peter, they took note that they had been with Jesus. I understand natural shyness, but brothers and sisters, the Holy Spirit has come in power to make us what we could not be in the natural, bold, courageous witnesses of the Son of God. The same men who cowered, the same man who cowered before his servant girl, is now facing the same group that condemned Jesus to death and saying, you crucified him through wicked hands. Repent. We need in this hour bold men and women, full of the Spirit, empowered to speak the gospel, not afraid of man. Years ago, I did a debate at the University of Tennessee, and I was so out of my league that all I could do was pray and fast and cry out to God for the power of the Spirit. And to this day, I have never experienced the power of the Spirit of God on me. He just said, literally, can I borrow your body for a few minutes? Step aside. And I was watching myself preach the gospel to an audience, and the Spirit disarmed the audience. That can happen to any follower of the Lamb. I like the early church because even the deacons had to be killed. Stephen, a deacon, shut him up. Next week we're having a kill the deacon service. All right. 